Um, first of all, welcome everybody uh, to uh, our May uh, show. Uh, it's going to be a great one. Uh, it's a really interesting story that that uh, Dana will probably introduce a bit more of it. Um, but I want to welcome everybody. Uh, just a little bit of an update. We had a great photographic show. Uh, we had over 400 paying guests and we had uh, about 85 uh, dealers with tables. It was an all day event and there's a lot of happy faces, I think, uh, including about 78 students, uh, young students, high school students who came. And I wanna thank uh, uh, Holly uh, Willington uh, for that. And as, as most of you may know, I hope anyways, is that you know we do get donations of, of cameras and darkroom equipment uh, and other things. And uh, almost all that darkroom equipment gets donated by us um, through Holly to go to schools. And uh, all these schools that have dark rooms uh, and, and, uh, and we're hopefully we be having a lot of younger students getting involved in, in the wonderful world of, of film. So uh, with that, I'm gonna uh, um, turn it over to Dana and she can introduce our speaker tonight. Dana. Thanks, John. Hi, I'm Dana G. I'm the program coordinator for FISNI. Uh, welcome, everyone. A uh, few things um, before we welcome our speaker, Bernie Zelich. Um, the screen is being recorded for YouTube. That's the active screen, as you saw when you joined. And um, if you're on a computer, um, your controls are at the bottom of your screen. Please, everyone, stay on mute during the presentation with the red line through your microphone. If you would uh, like to submit a question, please type that into the chat so that everyone can see it. And I'll pass the questions on to Bernie at the end of the meeting. And then if there's time after that, there'll be time for um, individual questions. Um, and if you have technical difficulties, just post them in the chat and we'll try our best to address them. And please use everyone for your chat responses. And at the top right, uh, speaker view under view is best for this presentation. Um, and uh, so let me introduce our speaker, um, Bernie Zelich. Um, how does somebody with no particular background in the field discover an unknown but prolific and artistic photographer? In late 2020, neoclassical songwriter Bernie Zelich retired from journalism and software engineering was creating a music video about a mill ghost from 1909. He came across a UMass Lowell image of a haunting anonymous mill worker. That single photograph, which he used, set him on an unexpected quest that ultimately revealed the remarkable photographer, Annie Powell, born 1859 in West Yorkshire, England, died 1952 in Lowell. To help understand the mill worker photo, uh, Zelich contacted Annie Powell's descendants. They had kept her final effects long after having lost track of their owner. Bernie created the By Annie Powell Inc., a nonprofit devoted to acquisition, preservation, promotion, and research. And ByAnniePowell.org goes live, um, has gone live on April 15th. And Annie's great, great, great grandniece serves as a director. I have dropped the link to the website into the, into the chat. Um, so tonight, Bernie will delve into Annie's work and life and the forensics of tracing her photographs. Bern, uh, Bernie, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Dana. I'm happy to be here. Let me fumble to see if I can get this to work. Uh, okay, so this is gonna be fun. May 1st, 1923, 100 years ago, the Merrimack River flooded Lowell, Massachusetts. And we have this beautiful memory of people enjoying the calm that followed. This is one of 3,000 existing uncredited images, late 1800s to about 1940, that have striking commonality. Most of the 3,000, but not all, are cared for by the Center for Lowell History, like this one. It's part of their city engineer's collection.
Here are others in that series. It's easy to see the competent composition and storytelling. The city engineering engineers got art when really all they were looking for was pictures of cracks in sidewalks, potholes, and construction sites. Most were from glass plate negatives. Here's an example. More than 30 years after 1900, when roll film became the easy choice for nearly all photographers, most showed signs of extensive manipulation. In this case, you can see a brown slurry, a brown wash applied, which causes some vignetting. Here's the, here's the positive version of it. And it's subtle, but you can see some of the wash there. So I'll move through about 10 of 3,000 images in chronological order, order, chronological order, letting the images speak for themselves. These photos were almost certainly taken by Annie Powell, born 1859, second oldest of seven children of a farmer and his wife in Meltham, West Yorkshire, England. 1880 married John Powell, they had no children. And shortly after that, they established a photo studio. And one thing that I came across is they certainly had independent careers from the start. A few years later, 1892, they followed her uncle, her older sister, her brother-in-law to Lowell, where she died in 1952. At age 92, in her niece's home in the Highlands neighborhood of Lowell. These photos were almost certainly taken by Annie Powell. How do we know that? I'm gonna be a wise guy. These plays were almost certainly written by William Shakespeare. How do we know that? Last count, there are actually 87 Frankly. alternative candidates, including Cervantes, the Spaniard who wrote Don Quixote. How do we know he wrote this? The same way we know Annie Powell took those pictures, a preponderance of evidence. So we can actually see who paid for that photo. We have the invoices sent out by the finance department in 1923 that year. And it wasn't Annie Powell. It was DC Donaldson and they were paid Maybe 40, 50 cents a photo, I figured, which is about $5 in today's dollars. Here's their ad. And UMass Lowell has some packing slips which confirm or corroborate that in fact, it was Donaldson photo that might have been responsible. But this was a family business with no photographers of the right age. They were in the business of selling sleek Kodak cameras to the do-it-yourself photographer. Lugging around an ancient glass plate camera would have been laughable to them. 
bad for business. So they must have been contractors. Yes, they must have subcontracted the work to people like Annie. And in fact, there are other contractors, other paid invoices, notably Donaldson's real estate business partner, McAvoy Optical. Although in the early 1900s, before the start of the finance department reports that we have, it does look like Powell Studio had a relationship with the city engineers. This is a popular column in the Lowell Sun, 1945, which refers back to a photo which was mysteriously received by the mayor's office. And the photo shows, it muses about this photo, it shows a group of five men mixing concrete or asphalt on a city street. An advertisement on its back relates that it was made by John Powell, photographer, 55 South Whipple Street, who no longer is in business. Well, if we go back to the city engineer photos, this one, this is a very likely candidate around 1902 for that. In fact, it has Annie Powell's handwriting on the back. Um, so even though there aren't five here, we know five people as the article stated, we know that uh, as a side hustle, she and others certainly would have liked to sell souvenirs to people who were as a side gig to, to people who were they taking photos of. These images have been around for decades. So why has nobody made this connection? Well, the answer is, as Dana suggested before, it's really my own story. Because just over two years ago, I identified Annie Powell's final effects at 63 Harris Avenue in the Lowell Highlands. And here's how it happened. That's the home there. So I was writing this piece for soprano and string trio. I'm a classical songwriter, Five Threads of Gold, a ghost story. And I was looking for a photo, which was a, would, it be, a, would be a ghost uh, from 1909. And I came across this one. I quickly decided how hard could it be to figure out who took it because nobody seemed to know. And I said, I was a journalist, I could figure this out. And quickly I found this ad in the Lowell City Directory of 1906. And I knew, I really did know that this studio had taken this picture. Partly I understood the vignetting that happened here, the negative manipulation here, also very clear, very on, on this photo. Somehow, it, these people were involved with this. So this is what I found in the house. Of about 75 items she chose to keep in the last three years of her life, some were personal memories like her mother and her sisters back in Melton. And this was eye-opening. This is a photo of her about 15 at a tennis court then known to be in Melton. Look at what's next to her on the bench to the right. It's a box camera. That tells us that not only was she a photographer, but she was since she was a little kid. Here's an early photo in the house that she took of one of her six sisters. And here you can see her early interest in vignetting. And also a nice expression. This, by the way, is a bird whistle. This is her sister birding, which would be a popular British name. Here's a photo taken of, taken of her grandniece, Phyllis Devno. And there were cute kid pictures, lots of cute kid pictures, which were probably taken around 1896, late 1890s. And this corroborates that she had this interest because here's an ad from 1896, which says, we are unexcelled 
in children's photos, which I think is probably something we can agree at. Look how cute this is. And by the way, this is a glass plate camera. And there were some handwriting samples. I added to this an important and also important biographical details when I discovered the records of the primitive Methodist church, her church, most recently Matthew's Memorial. And they were kept now in the Chelmsford Bible Church. This is her handwriting. This is her handwriting. Found some more too. So what was not there? Significantly, there was no memorabilia of her husband. There were grand nieces. There were, uh, there were nieces by marriage. There were lots of people, nothing about her husband. In fact, quite the opposite. It looks like she tried to tear up the memory of her husband, literally. Take a look at this. This is the complete cabinet card around 1900. And here's the cabinet card, obviously faded, and she tore up the part that says J. Powell. Since then, we found out that John Powell and her were separated between, at least between 1906 and 10 to 12 years later. So this would be a good time to talk about whether John Powell took some of these photos. The answer is a few but decidedly not very many at all. This is despite the fact that he appears and Annie does not appear in the history books for photographers of this time. He did advertise a lot. It's conceivable that these advertisements were for the sake of his wife. Um, that's maybe how they did it. But here we see in 1922, you're about the same time as that other photo, when he joins the um, Pentucket Masonic Lodge, he lists his occupation decidedly as optometrist. I think that's what he was. The other thing we did not find were exact copies of other collections. That was initially a big disappointment because all it would have taken is one or two photos that were in other collections and we have a smoking gun. It didn't happen, although there were some very interesting links. And I came to realize that the reason it didn't happen was because these are only 75 or so of thousands of photos she took, which somehow had meaning to her. It's quite understandable that a picture of a pothole did not have a lot of meaning to her in the final three years of her life. So, with a little time that we have, I'm going to focus on two of the municipal collections. The name of the title had something to do with Annie Powell in plain sight, so let's have some fun and see how obvious she was during her time. Here's a picture of her at 68 walking across Lakeview Avenue at Bridge Street in 1927. Let's get some focus on that. Here's a picture of her in 1945 with sister, that's her on the right, with sister Clara. So let's compare the 68-year-old Annie posing as a lawyer to her as 80, at, at 85. Well, I think she's pretty spry in both places. You can see a wider nose. The glasses seem similar. There's some blurriness, but I can see that they're probably the same people. Here's a picture of her crossing Merrimack Street at Kirk Avenue. And here's her close up. I think she intentionally blurred herself out when there were selfies. That's, my, that's what I've noticed. Well, we don't just have selfies. We also have unintentional selfies. So we saw this picture earlier which is lovely, take a look. Who, who knew in 1924 that horses were gonna be competing still with cars? Take a look at this reflection in the mirror. Is that the reflection of this person? Let's blow that up. 
Decidedly not. It's actually a reflection of the photographer, Annie. In this case, she was 65. Here's one where she would have been 63 a few weeks before the flood picture. And it's a rare one because she's not wearing her floppy hat. This one from March 20th, March 20th, is it 20th? Yeah, 20th, I think it is, 1924 at Moody Street shows her carrying her camera. It's a big one. Looks pretty bulky. Let's talk about handwriting analysis for a moment. So I am not an expert, but I would argue an expert is uncalled for. There's no forgery here to be determined. Nobody's trying to disguise their writing. And a rudimentary knowledge of handwriting, say understanding a person's quirky letters is an easy task. So a few weeks ago, I brought this handwriting, this is the original handwriting on the first photo, to an undergraduate forensics class in the UMass Lowell Criminology Department, along with these others that I put together, all between 1916 and 1940, starting with city engineers, ending with housing authority. So for two hours, among other things, we considered whether this block printing from 1916 to 1940 was the same person. And if that person was Annie. The verdict, very high probability, they said. There is circumstantial evidence that Annie took the city engineer photos as well. And that has to do with a hiatus around two important deaths in her life. First is John Powell, who died July 20th, 1928, two days before his death of an ulcer. The photo stopped at City Engineer. And they didn't continue until two weeks after words. Presumably she was taking care of grieving, possibly, taking care of business arrangements, when the photos continued, they continued at a, they picked up at a furious rate, the highest rate ever, as if to say, we don't have anybody else, Annie, to do this. So there's a lot of work. Sorry for your death. Take some pictures. The second was actually quite tragic. Her elder sister committed suicide in 1932. Following that suicide, she stopped taking pictures for the city engineers and didn't pick up again until uh, 1940 uh, when she did some work for the housing authority. So let's talk about some characteristics of her style. I call this series the Jack in the Box. Uh, it's people seeming to jump into the frame. Almost always, it's from the left side, a very quirky kind of gesture. Let's take a look. We know she took this one because it was in her effects. It's a photo postcard. Take a look at the, and it's probably, nine, I believe I looked it up. I believe it's a 1916 Model T Depot hat. Um, maybe people know better. That's what I found out. Uh, and take a look at the lady at the left, jumping in. She's the jack in the box in this case. Hey, here I am. What's going on? Who's taking a picture? Here's one from the 1912 book. It's not great reproduction because uh, it's from a book, The Record of a City. And we got lots of people looking out windows to the left. Here's some of them. This is from the Camara collection, the very important Portuguese American collection at the University of Lowell, which documents, which is the only uh, substantial documentation of Portuguese Americans in the beginning of the last century. And let's take a look. This is a neighborhood called Back Central. Let's take a 
look at this guy here popping out. In fact, whoever took the picture liked the idea so much, or the next set sitters liked it so much that I think it's the same guy that's popping out. And look, other people are curious onlookers. It's almost a modern idea of uh, uh, what, are, what do they say in plays, uh, breaking the, the fourth wall or something. They're looking at, 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 the, at the photographer taking the photo. So here's one uh, that we use on the website. And uh, it's a beautiful, I think it's a beautiful photo. I love the way it was orchestrated with five people, one, two, three, four, five coordinated, including this one here who can't hear anything. So she must have had used hand signals. Open your mouth more. I don't know what she was saying. So let's take a look here. That's him. And this is from the 1940s housing. There's a woman looking out the window and actually look at this, we get a twofer. She's holding, uh, looks like she's holding a watering can. And here's a photo, this is um, not, not a high res, this is a low resolution. It looks like we get a, a, a shot of Annie here too in the window. Next thing I wanna talk about is negative manipulation. So after I discovered that photo that I used in the music video, I ran down to French Street in Lowell and they let me put that image, that uh, glass plate negative on the light table. And I saw exactly what I was expecting to see. So these shadows, which I thought were fake, were humanly intervened and this brick I thought was also uh, humanly intervened are actually the case. You can see here on the negative that probably a ruler was used, a straight edge was used to draw, to scrape out a line, which now appears like this. You don't hardly see it on the print that it's scraped. Uh, there's, there's some more scraping here and possibly and up here. And certainly they're scraping to get the detail of the brick which the same light would have washed out normally. In addition, I also find it fascinating that the industrial lighting, the harsh industrial lighting was black, was whited out. So you couldn't see it. And it was replaced by two dots, well positioned to almost frame or halo her head. Beautiful. Finally, if you look at her feet, the vignetting is complete. She scraped out this area so that this looks like a nicely romantic, uh, possibly sentimental photo, you might say. So later, this would be 1922, she developed the way, this is a negative, also at uh, UMass Lowell, uh, part of the city engineer, she developed a way of applying a brown stain instead of scraping or whatever else she was doing. And that seems pretty effective. Uh, in this case, let's take a look what it looks like. It's fairly subtle, but just memorize where this is. Memorize where these lines are. It does make a little bit of a difference. So that's what it looks like when we're all done. You can still see the idea that this has been yetted. This one is strikingly manipulated. Uh, it almost looks like a different photographer. It's so, so uh, it's brash. This is the winter and uh, it's almost um, existential. No one's looking at each other. Uh, the one guy who's doing anything, he's probably the center of interest. He's uh, considering his lunch at the Waldorf lunch. And uh, there is a, like a, like a, heavenly line going to some distance that's separating everybody. So let's turn this into a negative and let's see what that looks like. How much manipulation is there? I thought there, that this is all manipulated. That's certainly not the same as this snow here. Let's take a look. And of course I'm right because I practice this. If you look down the middle, it's totally blacked in. 
And you can see there's some, a lot of evidence of lots of manipulation here. So this is interesting. Uh, we find, take a look at this kind of person here and this kind of person here in this photo taken in 1930. Let's blow that up. Well, this person almost seems like uh, a phantom, some kind of uh, uh, some kind of object from somewhere else that scarcely has a leg, scarcely has a head, seems to have a white flowing something on, sort of has one one leg. Very interesting, otherworldly, I would say, and also otherworldly, I would say, is this woman who I'm quite sure is Annie, who seems to have had drawn on her something like a skeleton or something in her own private iconography. It's hard to say, but it's undeniable that this is drawn in. The second thing we see in around the 3000 photos is what I call sham shadows. These are shadows that defy physics. Give you a couple examples. We already saw this one. So here's a shadow that sort of defines these four guys here. It's faded, so it's not a great photo. It might have been better at one point, but this this is undeniable. Where is the shadow coming from? Is it from the tree overhead? I don't see a tree. No, it's it's drawn in. So that's an early example around 1902 of her doing that. This is an example of, uh, this is from the 1912 approximately Appleton Mill photos, the Portuguese series, the same series that that original photo that I used for the music video was in. Take a look at the light source, very strong window light from the left. Now take a look at her arm here. It seems like equally strong or stronger light is coming from the right to cast a shadow going against physics somewhere in between, clearly intended just to frame her a little better. And it's also possible that this box or this uh, chest in the back is, is also drawn in. Let's take a look at the negative here. So it's pretty clear that you can almost see the paintbrush marks on this, that this is drawn in. And it, I think it's pretty equally clear that this which normally would be shaded by this window and her, her body would shade from this window is actually quite dark, turning out pretty light here, all for the purpose of having a nicely framed photo. A lot of work. She didn't get paid much to do this. They were, made, they were generally picture postcards that these poor mill workers would use to send back home to Portugal. So, Let's take a look at this one. Um, one of my favorite ones. We look, we saw it before. I would say that this and this are introduced. And in addition, in a street where horses and cars are going down the street, you don't see horizontal uh, lines like this. You, you see more lines like this. And there's no tree or anything like that that would explain this. So let's take a look at the negative version of this. And you can see it's much more dramatic. This is clearly scraped out. And you can see this has clearly been, it almost looks like a chemical that is because it's fuzzy, probably not a scrape. I'm not sure. So I'll finish the talk with some more surprises in this original photo. But first, you need to understand Annie's connection to God and her revivalist church, the primitive, primitive Methodist church. Consider two of her photos, I think it's three I ended up with, to see how she believed the day of reckoning is near. Photo one is one that she took at Edson Cemetery, probably December 8th, 
1920, probably this woman, Annie's sister, Clara Wood, visiting the grave of her daughter who died a few years earlier, Evelyn, of diphtheria. This is Clara's daughter, Anna Wood, Annie Wood, with whom Clara and Annie Powell spent their last years of their life. And this is Phyllis Devno, Annie Wood Devno's daughter. Okay, now we know who everybody is. Interestingly enough, all but this, in that scene, all but this girl would later be buried in that same plot, which is to this day unmarked. Uh, which is to this day, just a few feet away from Jack Kerouac's very marked grave. So Clara was a widow. She, uh, so there's a lot of heartache here. Uh, she was married to a man who died of a heart attack outside her house on Andrew Street near the Concord River. Um, and Annie Powell, the master of capturing expression, did so on this somber occasion. But she did something else too. She put more of her hand in, into this photo when she reached the dark room. Take a look at what's on. This is a low resolution photo. Take a look at what's on Clara's neck. Who, Clara did not have a tattoo, but in this version, she has a cross, possibly a cross. I looked around that would have appeared on another gravestone in the cemetery at that time. Look at her hand. There's a skeleton drawn on her hand. That is some serious stuff. Let's take a look at this selfie you saw a few minutes ago. There are many city engineer photos which feature a large lurking man, almost certainly one of her drivers from the city engineers. This one's particularly ominous hiding behind a pole and waiting for her to cross the street. Annie set up the camera and he's operating the cable release almost certainly. You can't see it, it's behind on the curb. So it's not hard to see this as an autobiographical tableau, something like, I prepared across Kirk Avenue aware an agent of God could be leading me into the next life. And finally, I do have this photo, which I add because it's so dramatic. It does not look dramatic here because it's small and it's very personal to Annie. You see a guy on the right staring at someone on the left who seems a little preoccupied with either a book or writing something. Maybe he's on his cell phone. That's what it look, sort of looks like now that I think about it. And what you don't see is, until I blow this up, is that this guy on the right is standing outside the Ranier and Ranier undertaker's office. This is not Ranier, by the way. He has the wrong age. He's probably one of the drivers dressed up this way. He's looking intently at this man down the street who is preoccupied, like I said, Take a look here. There's a shovel. Who uses a shovel when they're an un undertaker? That's pretty heavy stuff, too. Very personal to her. Somewhere in here, there's probably a pothole. But what we see is a very strong tableau, a very strong story. So now let's return to 100 years ago. One of the things I enjoy most about songwriting is I get the chance to get into very different people's heads, people's heads which are very different from mine. And then I understand them well enough so I can tell their story in a song. So I'm gonna ask for your indulgence as I try to relive what Annie was thinking as she set up this photo. First, she was thinking, I need some money. She was always impoverished. So I can sell, maybe I can also sell the same scene to the Lowell Sun. Why do I think that? Because it actually happened. 
that same day on page three, there's this scene in the Lowell Sun. Let's crop it. Let's add the other scene. And you can see it's the same tripod, except it was taken at a slightly different time without people of interest. She probably sold it to Barr Engraving, who seem to be taking the credit for it. Not Annie. Back to what she's thinking. Maybe she was frustrated that the boys kept saying, what? Because they couldn't understand her very thick West Yorkshire accent. It's one of the toughest they say in English. Maybe she was thinking how much she loved children. And if she had them, she might have had grandchildren their age, just thinking, just getting in her mind. Maybe she was excited about the dark room her niece was building for her. There is evidence that Annie Wood Devno completed it for Christmas that year, and it still exists. Here's the soapstone sink now obviously used for a washing machine. This is probably her original chair, and this is probably for her supply cabinet, which seems to be uh, light proof. Back to her, maybe she was thinking about her minister. Reverend Nathan Matthews was her age, also from England. He had died a few months earlier. Maybe she was thinking of the Northeast Primitive Methodist Conference, which her church was hosting in a few weeks. Maybe she, someone, maybe Annie, whose listings in Lowell Sun are almost exclusively about her Bible study class, was thinking of the peace after the flood in Genesis and the dove and the olive branch. Maybe she was thinking how later in the dark room, she would alter these two people who she had staged to be walking towards her. Notice before I blow in on that, that the foreground and the background are in focus. So when I blow in on the blow up on this, sorry, let's do this. They are not out of focus. They are what we would call airbrushed. Again, they appear to be somewhat from another place. Uh, you hardly see, you don't see any heads. There's kind of a strange neck on this person. Very interesting. Maybe she saw them as messengers from somewhere else, saying that God is going to bring his peace, something like that. In Noah's Ark, we don't know. That's, it was very personal for her. Then she did something very surprising. Take a look at this area camouflaged by, there are some letters that are camouflaged by the letters of the billboard, but she wrote in three lowercase letters in a period. Clearly you can see the G, or let's blow this up a little bit. So I, I made this a negative. It's, you can see the G is superimposed on a tree, not on the billboard. There is an E that is also slightly superimposed on the tree, not the billboard. There is a C similarly imposed on the tree, and there is a period. So what could that mean? To solve this mystery, let's look at the housing authority photos from 17 years later. A number of them have Annie's handwriting. We're looking at it here. She would have been in her 80s. I noticed that her handwriting was all ending with the initials A, C, G. Made no sense to me. A is Annie, but CG is not Powell or Townen or Hannah or any of her other names. What could it be? And then I thought of how devout Annie was, and I wrote a whimsical note to myself that it could be Annie, child of God. Flashback to this other picture. This could be seen as E C G. Wow, as it turns out, shortly after this photo was taken, Annie actively and publicly insisted people stop 
referring to her as Elizabeth and call her Annie. So maybe it's Elizabeth, child of God, later Annie, child of God. And I thought, wow, where am I going here? <laughs> Is there e maybe there was a hymn in her mind that day. I have quite the imagination 100 years ago. Could have been. So important were gospel hymns in her church, it turns out. They published their own hymnals. They had their own press. One of the more popular gospel songs at the time was A Child of God. This would have been in her hymnal. Praise the Lord, my heart with his love is beaming. I am a child of God. Heaven's golden light over me is streaming. I am a child of God. I'm a better songwriter than I am a singer. The truth is, I'm getting uncomfortable exposing an artist, artist's private message even 100 years later. The truth is, her religion may have led her to keeping everything private, including her role in thousands of images. My wife has told me, Annie wants you to discover her but she wants to make it hard. I can turn that around. Annie wants to make it hard, but she wants you to discover her. Thank you very much for listening to me. Um, I hope you enjoyed discovering Annie. And if you wanna learn more or con contribute or contact, uh, this is the uh, website. So I will take any questions you might have. Thank you, Bernie. Um, fantastic, fascinating presentation. And um, before we uh, start some questions, if everyone would like to unmute, give Bernie a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> Great job, uh, Bernie. Bernie, if you would like to uh, leave the screen up, that's great. Um, folks might want to switch to um, speaker view uh, side by side, I believe it is. Um, that way we can see um, Bernie uh, as he's answering. The should, I, should I stop share? Is, is that the deal? You can. Then, then we could see more I people. But see I don't know if you wanted to leave that slide up. Okay, and actually one reason to keep share is, is if someone wanted to relive a slide or something like that. Um, let me see, uh, let me look at the chat. Um, L-E-R has a question. Uh, I believe in your writings that Annie hand colored photos as well. I was late for the call, but are there any examples of those shown? So I didn't, and there, there, there is actually one extraordinary example of her hand coloring, which I, um, which is in the descendant's house, the 63 Harris house, which is a picture of four of her nieces, including Annie uh, Wood, at ages, uh, I think from one to six, sitting next to each other. Um, I don't know if I can get it quickly, um, but it's extraordinary, it's four feet long. It's an extraordinary photo. I think it's uh, the most amazing thing. And uh, it'll never go to a museum. I and mean, the family will always keep that. It really is an amazing photo. So there's a few like that. Um, I found one or two, but, but that wasn't a big thing, even though she did seem to advertise in the past that she colorized, she apparently didn't keep any of those. And I haven't, in the field, they haven't come up so much. Let's see. Um, I had a few questions. Uh, I am not an expert in table release technology of that period, but the ones that you indicate are selfies, sometimes I wasn't sure how she was setting up the shot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's an excellent question. Other people have questioned that too. So I know about cable release because in Chelmsford, there was a... Uh, uh, I forgot his, Emerson was his, his last name. I think his first name might've been Frank. There was a photographer who did a lot of uh, selfies uh, and stopped uh, his uh, glass plate camera. 
um, in 1910, his work in 1910. And he had a 30 foot long rubber hose with a ball on the end, and that's how he did it. So I'm presuming that's how Annie did it. You can actually see uh, examples, other, I didn't give any this time, there, but there are plenty of examples where she is standing near a curb and it's clear it's her. And uh, she, actually on the website, you'll see one on the, on the uh, page that says uh, Discover Annie. On the, web, on the second page where it says Discover Annie, there's one there where her, uh, her uh, it's, it's, uh, it, the uh, cable release, the rubber tube is, is uh, hidden on the curb, clearly. That's what it is. And there's actually one case where you can see one of her assistants um, holding a cable release. She probably said, here, you take the picture for whatever. She probably set it up. And you can see him clumsily holding it. So uh, we know that she did it. Um, the burning? Um, yeah. We're, we're going to wait until the end for the free form questions. There's a couple more people that to get to. Um, uh, Reich had a question. Um, did Annie use the same equipment, glass plates, folding bellows, cameras, and when did she stop photographing? So the second answer to that is that the last photographs we have from her are the housing authority in the 19, early 1940s. It's impossible since we don't have any of the existing equipment to say uh, what she used, although I can tell you she probably had several because what exists um, actually, don't even know that because there's several different sizes, and it's possible with a rig of glass plates that exists, and it's possible with a rig you can have a larger uh, glass plate camera that actually uh, takes a picture with a smaller uh, uh, glass plate. So it's kind of impossible to tell. We did see that one photo of a glass plate taken um, with a little child, and we also do. Sus I also do suspect uh, one of my colleagues in England showed me an advertisement for uh, a bankruptcy sale for a photographer that would have had a glass plate negatives in the, what are the 18, I forget, not dates, but it would have corresponded with when she and her husband went into the photo business. And he's made the point that um, they were both weavers. They wouldn't have had the money to go in, to set up and make uh, uh, backdrops uh, unless they got it kind of quick and kind of cheap. And that's actually a likely place where they got it, their, their first one. And I, my guess is they had several. Um, the, uh, the sort of compositions, the, what struck me is um, I worked with a collection in Haverhill that has a lot of the uh, city engineer photos similar. And what was interesting about those is sometimes they would even say, Mrs. Smith slipped off the curb. It was like an insurance photo. Um, yes. And it would just be like a random curb in the street. But there were often really interesting compositions of passersby and things like that. So how much staging do you think she did? And how much do you think she just had a really good eye for capturing? I, I think she did. Moment? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. I think she did an extraordinary amount of staging. I think she rehearsed it with these people a lot. I, I just see, I don't think there was any accident involved with any of this stuff including the one where the guy is uh, in, on Moody Street where the, uh, the grocery store guy, kid is uh, sort of sticking out. I think that's very well staged. I find, and those kids on bicycles, I think highly staged, including the people that are walking towards us, highly staged. Sometimes, um, sometimes uh, just one sec. Um, sometimes what I did notice was there were emotion blurs um, and things that um, that I wasn't sure whether they were camera effects or whether it was just the fact that the image was taken while someone was in motion. But it was interesting that there were different degrees of blurriness in the same photograph. Yeah, the one with the we have person a great, who was sort of in sure. white. The that looked like they were running, and then the the yeah. person to the side. So that's interesting. Uh, mostly it's it's not uh, blur, intentional birds, but we do have several circumstances where she told, uh, especially kids, for whatever reason, she told one of the kids to shake your head left and right and the other kids not. And it's kind of extraordinary why she would have done that. 
and the effect that it has. It's, it's quite comical um, and surreal, actually. <laughs> and, 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 and there's at least one other photo where she jiggled the camera, whether intentionally or not, and got a double exposure. And um, with her home where the, um, the materials were that, that you were working with, um, did, did uh, her descendants uh, talk about her using a dark room down there? Like, were they? Well, so that's, that's kind of interesting. And, and I've talked to them, I, I've become friends with them and I've talked to them a good, good deal about this. Uh, they're actually grateful to me because for whatever reason, they held on to these photos and they had no idea who took them. And uh, on, the, on the Powell side of the family, there was an estrangement. I, I'm telling you things that, that I, they wouldn't mind me saying. And they lost track of who all these people were. So when I entered their life, willy-nilly, they actually learned a lot about their family. I, I entered their life on day one. I knew all who all these, it was kind of extraordinary. They had all these stories. I said, oh, this is your great, great, great aunt, so-and-so. And I knew who these people were. And uh, to, to them, it was like uh, uh, a window open for them. That's, um, Reich has a question about the cable release or- So I, actually, can I, I, I want to mention one other thing about the, oh, sure. the dark room. Uh, it, it was just a, a whim I had one day. I said to uh, my chief contact there, who's on the board, Alexandria, I said, you know, is there any sink downstairs that, that's odd? And she said, as a matter of fact, the washing machine room has a very old soapstone, she didn't know it was soapstone, very old stone sink. And I said, let's go down, take, take a look at that. And it was obvious to me that that was a photographer's sink. And uh, so I put a lot together and figured out it was put in in 1923. So anyway, that was fascinating. Those are the kind of discoveries that you get. I remember reading and that it, when Eudora Welty was doing her WPA work, she used to develop film under her bed. Ah. Eudora um, Welty, the, the writer? Yes, she also did photography. I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. Um, then uh, Reich, Reich says that um, her cable release was used with a bulb to open and close the shutter. So it was a pneumatic shutter and the B on cameras yes. from the 20s onwards to today refer to the pneumatic bulb release. Oh, pneumatic, yeah. Hose. Yeah, that's, that's makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, it was a hose. Mm -hmm. um, who, who had a question? Uh, Dick Bolt. Hey, Dick. Uh, Ber Bernie, I've, uh, I'm, I haven't been ahead the sound loud enough to get most of it, but uh, I screwed up. I didn't get the sound <laughs> ready for to watch it. But uh, the last picture that showed the factory on the left and the flood, it looked yeah. like the it looked like it might be the uh, the factory where they made the uh, the cloth and so forth. Is that the is that Lowell Tech? Um, so I know where the, where that where picture the was taken. It's goes where, through, the Merrimack River goes through right there. Well, so I'll tell you, I, I know exactly where it is. Uh, it's where the Sampas Pavilion is right now. And obviously the landscapes change a lot, so it's hard to tell. That I don't think that smokestack is still there. Yeah, so it's, hard I, it's to water tell. power, so probably not the smokestack, but it could be heating for something. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, so I know where it was taken, but I, I can't tell you what the landscape was like 100 years ago. Okay. I, I went two years to Lowell Tech, so I, back in the 60s, so I, I know what it looked like. Yeah. So the, Lowell Tech is down by the uh, Pawtucket Falls, right? Question? Uh, it, it's, it's Lowell Tech is by Pawtucket Falls? Yes, yes, the dam and the okay. falls. Yeah, so this is upstream uh, two miles. I know about the I know about the dam and I know about the falls and I know about the river that went down on the side of the uh, Lowell Tech. I also yeah. know about uh, buying forty te old televisions and uh, uh, a lot of those were dumped right there at the road. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Into the water. Yeah, we don't know about that. 
<laughs> Dick, um, Ben just wanted me to relay that um, the recording of this presentation will be on our YouTube channel in a couple of weeks, so you can rewatch it with the sound. Okay. Sounds good. Let's see, any other questions? The um the sort of using photography as an art form to express yourself almost like a journal is what is really interesting to me about yes, you're making money and you're making a living, but you're also expressing yourself and you're capturing things that you see in a way that only you see them. So I really like the way you presented Annie's vision and uh, the way that she reminds me of other women photographers who you know, also did this kind of work and who weren't you know, that well known or possibly they were working um, for their husband or a partner's studio and weren't the main person under the business name. But um, she seems like a fascinating woman and I really loved the photos that you chose. Um, the, the website is wonderful. Again, I dropped it into the chat at the very top. So if you scroll up, it's um, by Annie Powell.org. And uh, there's a lot more content there that you can explore that Bernie has put together. And um, Bernie, with the with the UMass Lowell class, um, did they have an, any like interest in forensic photography, like the manipulation of negatives and? No, 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 no. They're they're interested in uh, catching crooks and uh, <laughs> uh, who are who are living now, not in the past. That's why this is so un, a little different. So yeah. were, I think they were less interested in the images and the forensics. How are we going to decide that these are the same as if it were something that came across their desk, uh, you know, in two years uh, with someone who had done a forgery or something like that. Yeah, uh, there's um, the New England um, Northeast Document Conservation Center has a number of photo conservators that work on material of this vintage all the time. And it might be interesting right. to talk to someone there or someone who does preservation yeah. just to get more, um, more takes on the the way that she manipulated things right and sure. um i have you have you gone on to um <clears throat> excuse me other photo um like chat sites and i know there's photrio.com and several conservation centers have i think chat forms i can send you some links um, yeah, that would be good if you could. Yeah, I've I've uh, reached out to let's say fem uh, women's photography kinds of places, and there's yeah. there seems to be some interest, but it's slow going to to be honest with you. Um, I, I think we need some more publicity. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if anybody, yeah. we're working on it. Um, there's a question from A. Simcox and D. Heath uh, asking, "How did you find her unmarked grave?" Oh, go to Edson Cemetery. They're wonderful. They're, they're used to tourists. They're used to visitors. It's a city-run uh, cemetery. It's one of two, or maybe more. Uh, and uh, they're very good about uh, giving you directions and even looking up old records on them. They're, they're just very nice people. Early on when um, Kodak was marketing cameras, uh, it was often two women, all the catalogs and the... Um, posters and things like that. It would be the Kodak girl and it would be a young woman or a girl holding the box camera. Um, so uh, there's like that that picture of her with, was it her sister or her cousin on the bench with the box camera next to her? Her sister, yeah. Her sister, that's a great picture. And Oh, it is. When I saw that, my heart stopped. Wow. <laughs> What, what is that? At first, I thought it was a purse or something. Then I realized that it was a box camera. Wow. At 15, she had that, and then, you know, way back. 
I I felt like it was something that they were trying to market to say that um, in a kind of not well just saying that you know anyone can take a picture and so a lot of the um, and this is when you could send the camera back to Kodak and they would develop it and send you back yeah. the, uh, the pictures so um I she looks like one of the girls in the advertisements just the clothing and the sort of happy yeah. pose with her sisters just reminded yeah, me yeah. of that yeah 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 yeah, she aged, you can see she aged very well. This is this is her in uh, her 80s, she's in her 80s here on the left in the one that's up. Uh, any other questions, folks? Okay. Um, well, I would advise everyone to visit byanniepowell.org and um, just think about what kind of stories you can discover when you're looking through old images or advertisements or newspaper photographs or city records. All these people who were taking these pictures that, you know, are sort of invisible in some ways. And it takes um it takes imagination and it takes you know curiosity and i love the fact that you found that photograph when you were composing a piece of music and um led you to this so thank you again um round of applause thank you so much dana and thank it's you it's really all great having you bernie and um i hope you'll come back and and visit us with you know our future presentations We'd love to have great. thank you very much. Um, okay. And uh, as as Ben always uh, is so wonderful about editing the the presentation, uh, we do have a YouTube channel, um, virtual meetings, FISNI, um, and uh, you'll be able to watch this presentation and other previous presentations. Um, this one will be up in a couple of weeks. So thank you, everyone. Um, Really enjoyed this. And uh, we usually stay on, Bernie, for a couple of minutes. Ben, how are we doing for time? I would say we're doing pretty well. If um, anyone has anything they want to mention before we uh, part ways for the night, I think that would be appropriate. I was just going to mention that on our next presentation, which will be June 4th, um, will be uh, Stephanie Tung, who is the Byrne family curator of photography at the Peabody Essex Museum, who led us on a tour of her exhibit, Power and Perspective, Early Photography in China. So Stephanie, Stephanie will be joining us to discuss that and some other projects um, at the museum. Um, so I hope everyone can make it for that. If you didn't get a chance to go with us on the tour, it's, it's a really amazing exhibit. There's a wonderful catalog that's available through the museum as well um, with the same title. Um, so that will be June 4th. And then July and August, we take a break and we'll be back in the fall. Um, and uh, as always, it's really wonderful hearing everyone's questions and being a part of this. So um, if folks wanna stay and chat for just a few minutes, is that good, Ben? Yeah, that would be great. I'll go ahead and I'm going to hit stop sharing on okay. Bernie's screen so we can have a better view of the gallery. Okay. Um, and if anyone wants to uh, bring up anything, otherwise, feel free to say good night and uh, we'll wrap it up in a few minutes. So, uh, Bernie, thanks so much. That was amazing. And Dana, great job posting as always. Thank you so much. I have a question for Bernie. Is he still there? Bernie? I think oh, I don't know. Off. No, I took off. Okay. You can contact him through the website. Yeah, I Sid. will. No, my question was uh, if uh, if she had a uh, another job, another source of uh, revenue and income. Um, mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, maybe she ran a studio up in Lowell uh, or 
uh, freelanced also as a portrait photographer, uh, freelancing and uh, she contract did work. She with her husband. I think I saw that in his writings. Okay. I think in her later years, the studio wasn't active, but I don't know exactly when mm -hmm. that stopped. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, as a partner with her husband initially, but um, that would be a good question for Bernie. So I will reach out to him or Sid, you can. Yeah. Um, Dana, do you remember our present uh, presentation we received uh, from the pistols and parasols? From Lee? Uh, yes. Um, do you know, was Annie mentioned in that? I felt like her, like she could have been mentioned, but she wasn't as famous as what Lee covered, correct? I don't, I don't think Annie was part of that group, but okay. I will double check. Um, I, is Lee here tonight? No. Um, yeah, actually, that's I will, how I will connect Bernie Lee. and Lee and see if they can figure that out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, but, but Bernie, Bernie found out about us. So I'm, I'm back, actually. I'm sorry. Oh, there you are. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm on my wife's account now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I know Lee pretty well. Uh, and we've I've talked to her great length about Annie. She did. She was not. She saw the ad of 1906 and didn't see anything since then and and did not uh, um, she just didn't do much with it. So she's she's actually been a great help in understanding some of this stuff. Okay. You should do a podcast episode. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we talked about, about that. We will. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's a question from Kathleen. Who was the dude with the old press camera dressed in the period clothes at Photographica? <laughs> Who wasn't? I missed Photographica, so you'll have to fill me in. Right, do you have the name of the person? Uh, I don't, um, but the, uh, the, I have to say the, the, the guy was there and a couple of other people took photographs. <laughs> Um. Well, that's fantastic. Tina, I think everyone seems pretty well satisfied for this evening. So yeah. I'd say it was another really successful event. And uh, so uh, thanks to everyone for coming out. And uh, and that was really fantastic, Bernie. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bernie. Yes, thanks. Thanks, Bernie. See you okay, again guys. soon, we hope. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Good night, everyone. Bye, everyone. Take care.